So this wasn't like the typical uh, speech that I usually do, you know, and I'd give you a legislative update and it would be fine and you'd feel like, oh, that's what's happening in Lansing. Uh, you know, spoiler alert, not a lot yet. We're still working on that. But uh, I did want to share a story about one of my friends who died two weeks ago. And it's sort of an odd way to start a pep rally speech, I suppose. But I want to tell you a little bit about my friend Jake Brewer. So you probably don't know Jake, uh, but you're familiar with who he is and the work he does. Jake was 34 years old when he was participating in one of those bicycle-thon uh, for charity kind of things, you know, uh, for to fight cancer, which wasn't even his cancer, he was biking for somebody else. And his bike veered out of control and into oncoming traffic. And he was struck and he was killed. And, you know, Jake was 34 years old. He leaves behind a wife, Mary Catherine, a daughter, Georgia. And, in fact, Mary Catherine is pregnant with their next child as well. I mean, it's just, it's tragic. And the thing that makes it worse is that Jake was one of the people that, I, that really had a, a spark to bring us together as a country. Now, the reason I said you might not, you might be familiar with Jake's work is, if you ever, you know, seen one of those change.org petitions, he was there and he was the guy that would help the decision makers who was being targeted in those petitions actually solve the problem. So after they got 10,000 or 20,000 emails, Jake's the guy that would pick up the phone and say to the CEO, you know, you've got a problem. Would you like some help solving that? Uh, Jake was one of the guys that was an early <coughs> founder in digital democracy. So, you know, he, was, he believed in the powers of networks to solve problems. And in fact, he was so well regarded that in May, he was, a point, he was uh, hired by the White House to be the senior policy analyst to our chief technology officer, Megan Smith. This is a guy that thought big. And this is a guy that genuinely loved people. And it didn't matter your political or ideological bent. You know, Jake cared about you, even if he didn't know you. And that's what made me fall, you know, in such appreciation of Jake. He believed that what unites us is more important than anything that divides us. And in fact, he believed that so much, his wife, uh, Mary Catherine, is actually a, a Republican analyst for Fox News. So, <laughs> you know, talk about uh, a red and blue household. But he loves seeing people get involved. And that's the thing that, that the reason I want to bring it up today, I want to honor Jake's memory, is because he believed that if you had a conviction, he wanted you to act on it. And he wanted to join in in helping you solve that problem. Because he didn't believe in living life on the sidelines. He wanted to be out in the field. And he believed that all of us could make a difference in the world. So when, when Jake died, his mother was in charge, um, because Mary Catherine had to stay home with, with Georgia. He, his mother was in charge of clearing out his desk at the White House. And I, I just can't even imagine what that must have been like for her, to have to go in there and do that. I know that because of the work you do, you see families deal with this all the time. But for me, it's still really fresh. And so, you know, I just, I think about what that must have been like for her going in to clean out his desk. But this is what, this is what motivated, me, motivated me to think about this speech. When she got there, she takes a picture of his desktop monitor um, because it has a sticky note on it. Right? And the fact that like, his mom stopped to take a, like, a picture of a sticky note and then send it to his friends, I thought was really interesting. And on that sticky note, it just said, had three words. It said, cultivate the caress. <laughs> so I don't know what a caress, I didn't know what a caress was. Um, but it's actually from Kurt Vonnegut's work, uh, 1963 work at Cat's Cradle. And what it means, and I'm going to read the definition, is that a caress is a network or a group of people who, unknown to themselves, are somehow affiliated or linked specifically to fulfill the will of God. I'm going to read it one more time. A caress is a network or group of people who, unknown to themselves, are somehow affiliated or linked specifically to fulfill the will of God. 
So I met Jake through my friends on the internet. <laughs> like, it was literally an email chain that turned into more emails, that turned into hanging out, that turned into working on projects together, that turned into a lifelong friendship. And sharing ideas about how we could use digital democracy to change the world. Because he thought that he could change the world. He somehow thought that this whole group of folks that apparently he was cultivating was going to be able to change the world. And he believed it. I mean, this is a guy that woke up every morning thinking about what are we going to do to make life better? Which also probably explains the quote that was on his desktop of his computer monitor. And, you know, of course, in Jake Spiler, one of those guys that actually had a clean desktop, right? I don't know about your mind's all cluttered with files and file names. But he wanted to see one quote, and it's from our president, President Barack Obama. And it said, every day, we use all the tools we have to fight cynicism, to unlock the possible, make life better for the American people and people around the world. And when I thought about this morning, that's why we're all here, isn't it? I mean, we dedicate ourselves to using all the tools that we have to fight cynicism, to unlocking the possible and making life better for people in our communities. When you see a patient, I know that you don't see what political party they belong to, their ideology. You don't ask them about a particular issue before you help them. You don't, make, you don't care about their race or their gender. You are there to treat a patient because you believe that all people can make a difference. You see patients as human beings. And when you do your job, the world is better for it. There was probably a nurse helping Jake. And as nurses, you know that there's just no act of compassion that's too small, especially when what the families that are going, are going through is just so big. And I think that's really true about democracy, too. There's no act of involvement that's ever too small when the work that we have to do together is so big. There's higher purpose to our work. So, as I'm sure you know, uh, the Safe Patient Care Act has been introduced in the past legislative sessions, and it hasn't made it into law. That's why I have the pleasure of getting to reintroduce it. And I just want to say, though, that it's a shame that we don't have it yet. Because it's, this is a simple act that would improve patient care, that would improve families, improve our work lives, that would make sure that we're, no one is being forced to care for someone when they've been overworked, overscheduled, and they can then provide, when we want to provide the most important critical care that we can. I mean, so simply put, we all know that the Safe Patient Care Act puts appropriate limits on the number of people that can be assigned to any one nurse. <laughs> and prevents manda uh, mandatory overtime. So in short, it's a win for patients, it's a win for nurses, and, and frankly, if we're being honest about it, it's even going to be a win for the hospitals, because they're going to end up seeing that they have improved patient care. So like I said, it's really unfortunate that we don't have this in law yet. But that doesn't mean we're giving up. Because as you heard, I am proud to tell you that in the next few weeks, we will be reintroducing this bill, and with your help, we're going to fight for its passage, we're going to get heard in committee, and eventually we're going to get this signed into law. So I want us to take a page or sticky note out of Jake's book. I want us to start cultivating our own caress. I want you mixed up and affiliated in the lives of my legislative colleagues so that they understand that even if they don't know why this is happening, that patient care, that making sure that we're protecting our workplaces is an important piece, and they see it as part of the higher calling that we're called to do to protect Michigan's safety. And I want you to call your legislators. I love getting those calls. I want you to pull out your phone in the next few weeks and call in about this bill. I want you making sure that we're sharing our stories about why this matters. Because 
When you do, it actually does. I am surprised every day that when I work with your fantastic lobbying team, that we find more people who everyone has a story, right? It's not always just them. It's because someone in their life they know is a nurse, and they had to leave, the, and that, that person left the state because they couldn't get a, pro, a, a good workplace. They find out it's a, someone that in their life that a nurse cared for, and they realize how overworked we are, and they wonder, did my mother get the absolute best care she could? And not because of the nurses, but because we're being asked to do too much when the need is so high. We have stories to share, and they want, need someone to tell them to. So when you call, you're a huge part of that. And when the bill comes up for committee, for a hearing in a committee, and I'm really hopeful that this is the year we can do that, that you show up, right? And it's hard, because I, I, I've done this sort of thing before, where you're being asked to be very vulnerable for a moment and say, I do a damn good job but I need help to do the best job I can for every single patient, every single time when the system is stacked against me. So if we're going to get this law passed, we're going to do it by working together. America is really built on a land of, of where struggle built opportunity. And you know, one of the things I think that we take away from our American history lesson is that we're always better when we're united rather than divided. So I know we're going to have some conversations today. I know there's a lot of things happening. But I hope that the lesson that we take away when we are finished with this gathering today is that we have an opportunity to be united. And what are we going to do with this chance for us to be together here today? I invite you to take advantage of this extraordinary opportunity. You are all amazing people in one amazing room. And we should never lose sight of that. So I want you to actually, like, uh, you know, just take a minute. I'm sure you did this before, but just look to your left, look to your right, right? And we're gonna, I want you to look around. Don't look at me. If I'm still seeing your eyes, you're not doing what I'm saying. <laughs> right? But there, you're going to make big decisions. I get that. But you're all here because you care. You know, if there's ever a reminder that life isn't fair, it's hearing about what happened to Jake. If you ever need a reminder in how this network of folks who somehow pull together can make a difference, <coughs> I invite you to think of two things. The first is that uh, the day after the tragedy, some of his friends came together and said, hey, how are we going to help provide for Jake's kids so they can go to college? And can you believe that they set the audacious goal of saying, can we raise $200,000 you know, $25,000 a year to go to college these days for four years for two kids. That's $200,000. Can we help raise that over the next month to really put them in a good space? Well, they did. And they did that in 24 hours. <laughs> and then, I just checked it this morning. They've, since then, they've now raised a total of $420,000 from over 5,400 people. Those people didn't all know Jake, they didn't all know his family, but they got somehow a group of folks linked together, mixed up in each other's lives to fulfill a higher purpose. So you're on this grass together. You know, we are mixed up in each other's lives now because we have a higher purpose that we need to do. And you looked around this room because you know that everybody that's sitting here shares those same values that you do. So as my friend Jenny Kim Eldon said, Jake dreamed big and believed not only in his dreams, but he believed in yours too. So I close by saying, what are you going to do to fight cynicism? What are you going to do to unlock the possible? What are you going to do to make your dreams, our dreams, come true? We can do amazing things when we work together. Thank you for being a part of a solution, and thank you so much for being here today.